welcome back. And let me say again, welcome back to BSF. I don't need to tell you, but we have a great Bible study this year in Kingdom Divided. What a blessing it is to be back in God's word with all you who are so faithful to attend this Bible study with us, either locally or on YouTube or through the podcast. For everyone who might not be familiar with me, my name is Eric Hine. I am the teaching leader, and I'll be doing the bulk of the lectures this year. Several times through the year, Jared, the substitute teaching leader, will fill in for me and will give the lecture. Before we get too deep into our announcements tonight, uh, let's go ahead and bow our heads and go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are the sovereign creator who graciously pursues sinful man to bring them back into a right relationship with you. We're thankful for Jesus' atoning sacrifice and your plan for salvation. We pray through the year you will meet us in a special way as we go through this Bible study. And give us the perseverance we need to make it all the way through and protect our alone time with you as we study your word. In Christ's name, amen. Um, like I said before, I apologize ahead of time. The, the first lecture has many announcements, but there are just some SOP standard operating procedures that we must go through. Just so you know, this is considered our base class. It's sort of like men's BSF headquarters for Tucson, Arizona. If you turn your attention to the screen, you will see a map of the Tucson area. We have a satellite group in Catalina. We have a group in Green Valley. We have a group in Vail, and we have a group in Oro Valley. Now, if you're tuning into this Bible study and you live in Sierra Vista, Bisbee, Douglas, or any other Southern Arizona locations, and you wanna start a satellite class, send me an email and we'll see if God will open up another satellite class for us. Besides our satellite groups, this year we have two online Zoom groups, which have guys located in Florida, Ohio, Texas, Utah, and California. So if you have friends or family members who can't make it to our base class, Bible study, but you think one of our satellite classes or our online group might be a better fit for them, please just simply send them the azbsf.org link and they can sign up. Have you ever had someone ask you, what makes BSF Bible study different than other Bible studies? Well, the big difference is the BSF's fourfold approach to Bible study, which is simply the lesson questions is the first step, which you fill out the questions between you, the scripture, and God. The second part, we listen to the lecture, which covers the scripture section we've been working on all week. The third part, we break into small groups and discuss our lesson. And lastly, the fourth part is reading the BSF notes. I would really recommend with our challenging Bible study this year, rely on the fourfold approach to get the most out of this Bible study and don't leave the notes behind. Let's take a minute and talk about giving. Another BSF distinctive is we are a faith-based organization, which means we are not going to ask you for money or guilt you into giving. Obviously, BSF provides a lot of biblical resources to its members, and there is a cost associated with all these resources. But BSF is an organization that trusts God and that he will provide all the financial needs for BSF. But as maturing Christians, it's important to recognize that we participate in what God is doing in the world and in our community in many ways. And one of those ways is through financial giving. It's not that God needs our money, but God desires his people to have compassion on others and to be generous with what God has provided to them. So if you want to come alongside of BSF and help financially, you can give in person at the church or in person at the satellite churches, or you can give online through mybsf.org or through the BSF app. 
when you give locally, you or you direct your giving online to the local group, the churches that support us locally, like the journey, receive a higher percentage of the giving. We like it when you give online, but when you do, please earmark those donations to our local group. You might be thinking, well, how do I do that? If you turn your attention to the screen, I will take you through the steps. When you are online or on the BSF app, you will see a heart at the top of the screen. Tap the heart. Then it will take you to the next screen. And at the bottom of the screen, it says, give to a group. Tap that button. That will take you to a screen where you have to type in Tucson and tap the men button. Then you will scroll down to where you see the journey and you tap the give button. Then you can use credit card, PayPal, Venmo, however you normally make online purchases. Now, for those guys who love the simplicity of texting, you can text in your BSF offering. You can simply text the word give to the number 844-994-0533. This method is so simple. Once you've done it once, Every time after that, just text the amount and you'll receive an email from BSF listing your giving amount. Most of you are already familiar with our YouTube channel. For you new guys, all you must do is type in AZ Men's BSF on YouTube and it will pop up. Besides our videos, I will also be posting theological short videos from Dr. Tally, who is an Old Testament theologian focused on the weekly lesson. Also, Dr. Ken will be posting weekly deeper dive videos geared to challenge those who want to explore topics that the time format of the lecture doesn't have time to cover. Also, some of you don't want to stream videos on your phones. So we also have Dr. Ken's videos and the lecture videos as audio files on the three most popular podcasting services, uh, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. You can go to your favorite podcasting platform and type in Bible Study Fellowship, Arizona, and it should pop up. I'm sure many of you already know, but we have a lot of our local BSF information on the AZ bsf.org website. You can go to the class calendar and see what events are coming up. There are frequently asked questions on the website. You can access our blog post. And if any of you guys want to contribute to our blog post, just let me know. And much more information. Plus, it's a it's the simple way to act, access the podcast. Now, as you guys are inviting men out to our Bible study and your friend says, I just want to study about the prophets and not the books of the Kings and Chronicles. What do you say back to them? Tell your friend we can accommodate him and share about the mini series. Up on the screen, you can see we're going to have three mini series and all three are focused on one of the prophets. We will have a mini series on Elijah, Joel and Obadiah, and Jeremiah. Remember, mini series guests don't have to sign up for the class and they will be provided with the study material. Now, if you're new to BSF, you might be thinking about the very important question, just tell me where I can get the weekly lessons. Well, there are several ways. You can go to mybsf.org and get the weekly lessons, or you can download the BSF app at the App Store and get your weekly lessons, or you can go to the BSF store and order the complete Kingdom Divided book, or you can go to azbsf.org website and download the entire PDF and take that to a print shop and have a book made. BSF allows that. Okay, that was a lot of announcements, and I hope you guys are still hanging in there with me. As we get into our Kingdom Divided study, we're going to spend a lot of time this year reading through 15 books of the Old Testament 
in examining Israel's history up close and personal. As I'm sure we are all aware, Queen Elizabeth, Elizabeth II, passed this last week. And yesterday, we memorialized 21 years since 9-11. There are some events that are so big that it creates a ripple in time. You might be saying, what do you mean by that, a ripple in time? Well, 9-11 created this thematic twist in time. There was American life before 9-11, and now there is American life after 9-11. In some ways, America will never go back to what it was like before 9-11. And I'm sure as England moves forward with King Charles, there will be a ripple in time where people will be reckoning time in England by saying, that was during the Queen? or that was after the queen passed. Dr. Ken posted an interesting video to our YouTube channel about how the prophets reckon time back in their day. It's interesting, it's short, and I recommend it. That's an interesting thought. Did the prophets of old think about time the same way we think about time? This year in our Kingdom Divided study, I'm sure the Israelites reckon time based upon when King Solomon ruled, when the kingdom was united, and then after it split up. A major event like that would have created this ripple in ancient Israel's time. Well, our focus this year will be in this time of Israel's history when the nation divided and the prophets that God sent to his wayward people. During this divided period in Israel's history, 19 kings ruled the northern kingdom, and 19 kings and one evil queen ruled the southern kingdom of Judah. As the wayward Israelites pursued false idols and foreign alliances, God sent prophets as a wake-up call to his people. Well, through this study this year, we will see God's continuous reach to the lost. As God's people failed, to live as God's people. We will witness God's grace through warnings, and then we will see his justice through prophesied judgment, which will all come together to highlight the hope of restoration, which can only come through the anticipated Messiah. This year's study will be challenging since it will cover so much scripture. And as we dig in, you might have a family member, our friend, question why you are devoting so much time to studying the Old Testament. That might, they might say, how is that part of the Bible still relevant to us today? And why should we study Israel's ancient monarchy history? Those are two valid questions. And hopefully if you don't have a good answer tonight, through our study, you'll be able to address questions like that in the future. When Bible skeptics ask, how can I trust the Bible? A list of reasons run through most of our thoughts like internal consistency, manuscript reliability, historical and archeological accuracy, fulfilled prophecy, eyewitness testimony, and timeless authority and supernatural authenticity. But one, of, one that often gets overlooked is the evidence of changed lives. You guys have experienced this for yourselves. You remember what you were like before Christ, and you know what a new creation you are in Christ. And throughout church history, we have many stories of how God's word changed evil people for the good from the inside out. And I want to quickly share one of these stories with you. Back in 1789, Fletcher Christian and his band of mutineers cast Captain Bly and 18 men in a longboat as they took over the HMS Bounty. Eventually, Fletcher Christian and his men made it to Pitcairn Island in the South Pacific. There was eight of Fletcher's men, women, and six Polynesian men. So what happened? To, these, to this band of rebels. No one knew for sure until a whaling ship stopped to pick up some water in 1808 
and they found natives who could speak English and new Bible verses. It turns out the crew kept fighting and killing each other until it was down to the last two crew members. These two crew members, instead of killing each other, they decided to read the Bible. Then they decided to teach the natives the Bible and how to read and write by using the Bible. The whalers who were accustomed to finding pagan islanders when filling up on supplies, instead found a devout community that prayed in the morning and in the evening and were able to recite the Christian creeds and Bible verses and did not engage in sexual promiscuity like other islands. The mutineers' sinful ways were eventually going to kill everyone on the island. But God's word transformed the lives of the people who remained and the island flourished. The evidence of changed lives is one of several reasons why you can trust the authority of the Bible. I didn't mention this before, but we have a guest speaker tonight. BSF is doing something a little different this year. All the BSF classes around the world are opening with Dr. Mark Bailey. We're honored to have Dr. Bailey do the opening lecture. Dr. Bailey was the fifth president of Dallas Theological Seminary, where he served as the president for 19 years. Dr. Bailey has been on the BSF board for many years to help guide this organization. But here's a little unknown fact about Dr. Bailey. He came from Sedona, Arizona. He is a homegrown Arizona kid and from Sedona. No offense if you're from Sedona, but you really don't think of Sedona as a place where modern day theologians come from. No offense, but when you think of Sedona, you think about the Red Cliffs, crystal power, and portals to the other side. There are two divisions to Dr. Bailey's lecture, the authority of the Bible and the relevancy of the Old Testament. The... Uh, In the first division, Dr. Bailey will give us three reasons why we can trust the authority of the Bible. The first, the authority of the Bible is rooted in the authorship of the Bible. And second, the inerrancy of the Bible is rooted in the inspiration of the Bible. And third, the profitability of the Bible is rooted in the power of the Bible. In Dr. Bailey's second division, he will give us seven reasons why. The Old Testament is relevant for Christians today. First, the Old Testament records God's self-revelation of his character. Second, the Old Testament introduces critical biblical doctrines. Third, the Old Testament records judgment and salvation prophecies. Fourth, the Old Testament establishes covenant ideals for human flourishing. And fifth, the Old Testament details near and for our purposes for Israel and the nations. And six, the Old Testament reveals the Messiah through messianic promises. And seventh, the Old Testament was the Bible Jesus and the apostles used. Now let's sit back and listen to Dr. Bailey's introduction. Greetings, my brothers and sisters, in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. Vying for the influential supremacy in the shaping of the spiritual part of our lives are four competing authorities. For some, it's our own intellect and rationality. If it does not make sense to our minds, we will not believe. For others, decisions are made on the basis of their emotions. How one feels directs their choices. If it feels good, they do it. For those raised in a religious setting, it may even be the ecclesiastical tradition that controls behavior. One may simply have been raised to believe and live in a certain way. The problem is that all three of these can be plagued by human error and bias. The mind, the heart, or human tradition not led by the Spirit of God through the Word of God 
are always prone to deceit and defection. One of the great themes brought forward by the Reformation is that of sola scriptura, which means that the Bible and the Bible alone is our authority. The following statement is found on the BSF website introducing the doctrinal framework for Bible Study Fellowship. And I quote, the leadership of Bible Study Fellowship, including the Board of Directors, is committed without reservation to this statement of faith. In fact, the very first article of that statement expresses our commitment to the authority of the Bible. The first article is the Bible. And it states, and I quote, we believe that the 66 books of Holy Scripture as originally given are in their entirety the Word of God verbally inspired and wholly without error in all that they declare, and therefore are the supreme and final authority for faith and life. Psalm 119, 160 reads, All your words are true, all your righteous laws are eternal. And Paul, writing to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 2.13 states, And we also thank God continually, because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which indeed is at work in you who believe. As we begin this new year of study, in this new study of the people of the promise, kingdom divided, I want to talk to you about two major themes, the authority of the Bible in general and the relevancy of the Old Testament in particular. Since the Bible is the word of God, let me begin by making three statements. The authority of the Bible is rooted in the authorship of the Bible. The inerrancy of the Bible is rooted in the inspiration of the Bible. And the profitability of the Bible is rooted in the power of the Bible. There are three great passages in the Bible about the Bible that help us answer three questions as to why we see the Bible as our sole authority. Question number one, how did we get our Bible? The origin of the Bible is described in 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The Bible is not sourced in the intuition of human authors. The Bible is not sourced in the interpretation of human listeners. Peter tells us that the Bible is supernaturally sourced in the Holy Spirit and communicated through human authors. Literally, in the Greek New Testament, verse 21 reflects this emphatic truth by the very order of its words. If I could translate it, but by the Holy Spirit, being moved or born along, spoke from God, men. This is the process of inspiration. God spoke by his spirit through human authors and the result is the word of God. The second question we can ask and answer is what is the nature of the Bible? The nature and purpose of the Bible are clearly seen in 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17, where Paul reminded Timothy, how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. All scripture, passe graphe in Greek, every part or every passage of scripture. Graphe, it means writing. It's used 51 times in the New Testament. 49 times it refers to the Old Testament scriptures and two times to New Testament scriptures. The phrase God breathed, or as some have translated it, inspired of God, is a translation of one unique Greek word, theopneustos. It's the only time it's found in all of the scriptures. It comes from three words. Theos is a word for God. Pneuma is the word for breath or for, here I think, the Holy Spirit. And tos is a suffix meaning the result of. Hence, all scripture, every scripture, is the result of the Spirit of God, which correlates perfectly to what we saw in 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. Listen again to what Paul said about these sacred writings. They're able to make one wise unto salvation. They're given by the inspiration of God through the Spirit of God. They're profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. They help the servant of God become thoroughly prepared for every good work. A third question critical for our purpose is how can we know what God meant by what God said? 
The first key to understanding the scripture is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 through 16. This passage connects the links of God's communication chain, revelation, inspiration, and illumination, all three of which are necessary for our correct understanding in the application of the Bible, and all three involve the role of the Spirit. Revelation is that process by which God made known to humanity that which otherwise could never be known. The passage begins, however, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him, these are the things that God has revealed to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Inspiration, the second link, is that process by which God so directed the human authors of Scripture, without destroying their individuality, their personal interests, or their literary style, his complete thought toward humanity was recorded without error in the words of the original manuscripts. What Paul is speaking to the Corinthians are the thoughts of God brought by the Spirit into human language. Verse 13 states it this way, This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with spiritual taught words. The third link in our divine communication chain is illumination. Illumination is that process whereby the Spirit makes possible for us to know and willing to accept the right understanding of the Word of God. This is described in verse 12 and in verses 14 through 16. Paul says, What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness, and cannot understand them because they're discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? Paul says, but we have the mind of Christ. The authority of the Bible is rooted in the authorship of the Bible. The inerrancy of the Bible is rooted in the inspiration of the Bible, and the profitability of the Bible is rooted in the prophetic nature of the Bible. In addition to the argument of the Bible itself for its own authority by right of divine origin, all we need to do is read the New Testament to see how Jesus and the apostles endorsed the authority of those portions of the Bible available to them. Jesus cited 14 different books of the Old Testament during his ministry. He quoted scripture three times in resisting Satan's temptations. In Luke 24, 44, he affirmed the authority of all three parts of the Hebrew Bible and all that they predicted about him would be fulfilled. He affirmed the abiding nature of scripture in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. And he even affirmed the historicity of such events as the creation, Adam and Eve, the flood, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and the miracle of Jonah. There are two sets of passages that show how the New Testament writers viewed the authenticity and authority of the Old Testament. There are passages where the Old Testament records the words of God. The New Testament affirmed that those sayings are sacred scripture. What God says, the Bible says. And there's another set of passages where what the Old Testament states, the New Testament writers attribute to the utterances of God. What the Bible says, God says. As Benjamin B. Warfield concludes, the two sets of passages together thus show an absolute identification in the minds of these writers of Scripture with the speaking of God. Therefore, the authority of both Testaments is mutually confirming. What God says, the Bible says, and what the Bible says is what God says. We're now ready to talk about the relevancy of this year's study in the Old Testament, the relevancy of the Hebrew Scriptures in particular. It will come as no surprise that the Old Testament scriptures comprise 75% of our Bible. The Old Testament is foundational to the events and teachings of the New Testament. In reality, one cannot absolutely understand the rich theology of the New Testament without the Jewish background of the Old Testament. I would like to suggest seven reasons why the Old Testament is absolutely relevant for all of us living on this side of the cross. Reason number one. 
The Old Testament records God's self-revelation of his unchanging character for which he is to be known, loved, and obeyed. His power, his holiness, his unconditional love, his unending faithfulness. God is both creator and covenant maker. Knowing what God is like enables us to better worship him for who he is and what he's done. Listen to God's self-description to Moses from Exodus chapter 34, verses 5 and 6. Then the Lord came down in a cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. That's our God and he does not change. Therefore, understanding God's character and his ways in the Old Testament teaches us what is also true about our Lord Jesus Christ as revealed in the New Testament. Reason number two, the Old Testament introduces us to critical Bible doctrines, which are the cornerstones to the Christian faith. The doctrines of creation, righteousness, sin, judgment, grace, and salvation all find their foundation in the Old Testament. In the Hebrew scriptures, we have an extensive historical testimony to God's patience, his grace and his mercy with his people Israel. But we also see his standards of holiness, which demanded Israel's discipline and ultimately their exile from the land. Reason number three, especially appropriate to the Old Testament and especially our study of the prophetical books are the alternating oracles of judgment and salvation. In the former, judgment is warranted for unbelief and disobedience. In the latter, the blessings of God are promised for faith and obedience. In two New Testament passages, Paul brings this into view. In Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, he writes, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. And in 1 Corinthians 10 11, he states, These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. In summary, the prophetic message is, there is hope on the one hand, but warning on the other. In good times and bad, when the world finds itself in chaos, order and perspective are still possible. If we heed the lessons to be learned, if we endure under trial, encouragement and hope are still possible. Positive examples are lives we should emulate. Negative examples reveal the futility of living life apart from the guidance of God. This leads us to number four. The Old Testament sets forth covenant ideals for human flourishing, love, obedience, righteousness, and the ethical responsibilities of justice and mercy. Deuteronomy 6 and Leviticus 19 are the headwaters for the two great commandments of loving God wholeheartedly and loving others sacrificially. And as Jesus taught, these two summarize the purpose and essence of the entire law and the prophets. The poetical books of the Old Testament are by their very nature virtually timeless. The Psalms provide the lyrics of lament and the hymnody of praise. The wisdom books contain biblical imperatives as well as human observations. Not only is God's truth right, his way is always best. Living according to God's wisdom on the horizontal plane should be the natural reflection of the worship one has for God on the vertical plane. And for the secret of living in community, Micah 6, 8 reminds Israel, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. A fifth reason we should study the Old Testament is that it details the near and far purposes of God for Israel and the rest of the nations. The Bible shows Israel's place in the overall plan of God and in his unfolding plan of redemption for the human race. It records the nation's origin, their history, and their exile from the land, their return, and the promises for their ultimate restoration. God chose to use Israel for three major reasons. They were to be a light for the nations, a repository, not a depository, but a repository of the truth, 
and a channel of the Messiah. God's elective choice of Israel was not for their own supremacy, but for their representational ministry. They were chosen to be a kingdom of priests with the end goal of their intercession and proclamation to represent God to the rest of the world. That idealized goal as to why God chose Jacob and not Esau is found in Malachi chapter 1, especially verse 5, where he concludes, Great is the Lord, even beyond the borders of Israel. Old Testament prophecies included both short-term and long-term predictions. Therefore, the undeniable fulfillment of the short-term predictions serve to assure that the long-term prophecies will be fulfilled just as faithfully. Without a doubt, the major relevancy of the Old Testament is the prediction and preview it gives to the coming Messiah. And that's our reason number six. The Old Testament promises in great detail the coming of the Messiah and his roles as both sovereign and savior in the kingdom and redemptive purposes of God. Luke 24, 44 records Jesus' explanation to his disciples that all three sections of the Hebrew Bible, like we said earlier, contain prophecies that he would ultimately fulfill. He said, and I quote, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that was written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Without the Old Testament, we would not even know that there would be a Messiah, nor why he needed to come into the world. And as my friend Ken Boa states, when the Messianic prophecies are combined, the prophetic doorway becomes so narrow that only one person can fit through. Starting in Genesis 3.15, Scripture begins to talk about what Jesus will do, both to reclaim a kingdom usurped by Satan and provide redemption for a fallen humanity. Without the Old Testament, we would not properly understand the person and work of Christ. According to Hebrews, Jesus is not only our high priest, but he himself is the very sacrifice that he as the great high priest offered. He offered himself for us. And finally, reason number seven, to return to that great text of 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, what Paul described as all scripture was primarily a reference to the Old Testament. That was the Bible of his day. Because of its authorship, it is said to be profitable. That profitability is realized when we allow it to change our lives, to conform us to Christ's likeness, and to equip us for every good work of the ministry to which God calls us. In closing, I want to leave you with one of my favorite verses, if not my favorite. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. But we all, with an unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into that same image, from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. Summarized in this one verse are the critical components for defining the dynamic and maturing Christian experience. It is God's transformation of the life of the believer into the glorious image of Christ through the Word of God, by the power of the Spirit of God, in fellowship with the people of God. This, my friend, is in reality what BSF is all about. May this year be the best year of our spiritual growth experience that we've ever had.